The Roots of European Evil. Excerpted from Pagan Imperialism. Julius Avola. 1933. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. We said that the modern world has now reached a point where it is useless to delude ourselves about the efficacy of any reaction not originating from a deep spiritual change. We can only free ourselves from the evil which corrodes us by a total negation, by a spiritual impulse which truly makes us into new beings, reopening for us the possibility of grasping a new world, of breathing a new freedom, even if everything in which the West vainly prides itself should also collapse. In the awareness that our world is a world of ruins, we must push ourselves again toward those values which allow us to recognize unequivocally the cause of such a ruin. The first root of European decadence is socialism, the anti-hierarchy. The fundamental forms which have developed from this root are the regression of the castes, the development of sciences and positive philosophy, technology and the illusion of mechanical power, the new romantic and activist myth, These are the four principal roots of European decline, which we shall now consider one by one and then oppose them with our hierarchical values. In this way we will exhibit the fundamental features of another vision of the world and of life, which must have value for us as a secret force and as the soul of our battle. The regression of the castes. Gold and labor. We already alluded to the fact that if we could formulate a law in a very general way which gives us the direction of history for modern times, We could not speak of progress, but, if anything, of involution. In this respect, there is a process which imposes itself upon everyone's consideration in the most objective and evident way, the process of the regression of the castes. As the direction of history since the prehistoric era, we see precisely the progressive decline from one to the other of the four great castes, the solar, royal sacred, caste, the warrior nobility, the bourgeoisie, merchants, and the serfs, in which, in traditional civilizations, and particularly in Aryan Indian, the qualitative differentiation of human possibilities found its reflection. In the first place, we witness, in fact, the twilight of the age of royal divinity. The leaders, who are divine beings, who completely unite in themselves the two powers, the royal and the pontifical authorities, belong to a remote, almost mythical, past. This first fall occurred through a progressive deterioration of the Nordic Aryan force, the creator of civilization. In the German ideal of the Holy Roman Empire we recently recognized the last echo of this tradition, of this solar level. Once this peak passed, authority passes to the next lower level, the caste of warriors. It is about monarchs who are now simply military leaders, lords of temporal justice, absolute political sovereigns. The formula of divine right subsists at times, but is a mere memory lacking content. Behind the institutions that only formally preserve the traits of the ancient aristocratic sacred constitution, there were often only sovereigns of this type left in antiquity. After the fall of the universal medieval unity, this phenomenon is manifested in a definitive and decisive way. The second fall, aristocracy declines, chivalry is extinguished, the great European monarchies are nationalized and fall into decline. Through revolutions and constitutions, when they are not simply supplanted by regimes of a different type, republic, federation, they are transformed into the aforementioned empty survival, subject to the will of the nation. In parliamentary, republican, or national democracies, the establishing of capitalist oligarchies conveys the fatal passage of authority and power from the second to the modern equivalent of the third caste, from the warrior to the merchant. In place of the virile principles of loyalty and honor, the doctrine of the social contract now takes over. The social bond is now utilitarian and economic, it is a contract based upon the convenience and the interest of individuals. In such a way, the bond necessarily passes from the personal to the impersonal. Gold acts as an intermediary, and those who take possession of it and know how to multiply it, capitalism, industrialism, also virtually reach the taking of power. Aristocracy gives way to plutocracy, the warrior to the banker, the Jew and the industrialist. The trade in money and interest, previously confined to the ghetto, becomes glory and pinnacle of the latest age. The hidden force of socialism, of anti-hierarchy, begins to reveal its power visibly at this point. The crisis of bourgeois society, the proletarian revolt against capitalism, the manifesto of the Third International, and the correlative slow rise and organization of groups and of the masses in purely collective and mechanized forms, in the context of a new civilization of labor, indicate to us the third fall, through which authority passes to the last of the traditional castes, that of the slave laborer and mass man, with the consequent reduction of every horizon and value to the level of matter and number. If superhuman spirituality and glory characterize the solar period, heroism, loyalty, and honor, that of the warriors, and gold, that of traitors and Jews, 
So the coming of the slaves must correspond exactly to the exaltation of the principle of the slaves, labor is raised up to a religion. And the slaves' hatred comes to proclaim sadistically, whoever doesn't work, doesn't eat, and its idiocy, glorifying itself, forms sacred incense form the emissions of human sweat, work ennobles man, work is greatness, work is an ethical duty. Thus, the sepulchral stone covers the cadaver of man, and the cycle of involution seems to be conclusively completed. No other ideal offers the future to the priests of progress. For the moment, the struggle continues between the Jew, omnipotent master of gold, and the revolt of the slave, and that civilization, which our contemporaries are so proud of, hangs over a monstrous mechanism moved by the brute and impersonal forces of gold, capital and the machine. The bonds of dependence, far from loosening, have tightened again. But alongside force there is no longer authority, alongside obedience, no longer recognition, alongside rank, no longer superiority. The master is no longer such because he is master, but because he is the one who has more money, because he is the one who, even though he does not see it all beyond the small horizon of ordinary human life, dominates the material conditions of life, by means of which it is even possible for him to subdue or to oppress those whose breadth of thought is immeasurably more powerful than his own, the possibility of the most despicable fraud and the most awful slavery. The power and the tie of dependence depersonalized and mechanized, have become capital and machine. Thus, it is no paradox, only today can we speak seriously of true slavery, if we can speak of it only in the Western economic and mechanical organization, along the direction of brutalization, of which free America gives us the best example. Perhaps, after a short cycle of generations, duly and scientifically educated to the standards of social service, the sense of individuality will be completely removed, and, with it, the last remnants of awareness necessary to realize, at least, that they are slaves. Perhaps, what will remain will be that state of renewed innocence, which will differ from the mythical Eden by the fact that labor will reign in it as universal and sole purpose of existence, which Kirillov speaks about in Dostoyevsky's The Possessed, this is the ideal of the Soviets. A dependency without leaders, an organization indifferent toward every qualitative requirement, this social ideal, impersonal, brute force, made of mere quantitativeness and money, creates it. We said, without more leaders. Let us not be deceived by this indeed. Let us repeat that the race of masters, if it has not already disappeared, is close to doing so, and everyone proceeds in a crescendo of leveling, rushing toward a life that is more material and faceless. The so-called upper or ruling classes of today are such only ironically, the great leaders of the world financial organization, such as the technicians, industrialists, functionaries, and so on, represent nothing more than those freedmen to whom the masters once delegated control of the slaves and administration of their goods. The same yoke subjects them to the immense, blind, automized mob of workers and employees, and above it, neither slaves, nor freedmen supervising slaves, having any respite, and, above them, no one, this is the terrible truth of civilized men. And inwardly how much narrower, more dependent, and poorer is the day of the masters of gold and machine, without break, feverish, saturated with responsibilities, than the day of a humble artisan, so likewise is the day of the upper classes, for whom gold serves only to multiply morbidly their thirst for distraction, luxury, sensual pleasure, and further profits. There is no trace of masters in all this, and in their absence there is no meaning in this pseudo-organization. If one asks the millions of prisoners, among their machines and offices, for a reason, a justification, beyond the ephemeral thrill with which they seek to ape the refinement of the upper classes, they will have no answer. But if one goes up and asks the leaders of the economy, the investors, the masters of steel, coal, oil, gold, and peoples, have we not seen that the political problem today tends to be reduced to the economic one? Again, no answer. This means for life have controlled life, rather, they have reduced it to their means. And thus the great darkness have burst into the light of the pompous illusions of Western pride, a darkness which expresses itself in a very new and monstrous myth, that of work for work, of work as end in itself, as intrinsic value and universal duty. The masses of men on earth are devoid of light, reduced to pure quantity, only to quantity, made equal in the material identity of a parts dependent on an unstoppable mechanism left to itself which can no longer do anything, this is the perspective that lies at the base of the economic industrial direction which matches the entire West. Those who feel that this is the death of life, and the coming of the brute law of matter, the triumph of a fate so much more frightening since it is no longer personal, also feel that there is only one remedy, to break the Semitic yoke of gold, to go beyond the fetish of sociality and the law of interdependence, to restore aristocratic values, values of quality, of difference, and of heroism, 
to restore that sense of metaphysical reality which everyone today opposes, and which we, furthermore, affirm against everyone. And so, if understood as a revolt against economic tyranny, against the state of affairs in which the quantity of gold, and not the individual, rules, in which the concern for the material conditions of existence corrodes the whole of existence, if understood as the pursuit of economic equilibrium, on the basis of which diverse forms of life, no longer reducible to the material plane, are able to free themselves and to develop, if understood exactly in this way, but only in this way, we could recognize a necessary function and a future even in some extremist currents. The major cause of the lack of a qualitative differentiation in modern life consists precisely in the fact that it no longer leaves room for a type of activity that is not valued in terms of practical utility and sociality. The economic bias creates a leveling, imposing itself upon all alike, since differences based on gold and the mechanical economic hierarchy are not differences. They return in a single level, a single quality, beyond this level, taken in the totality of all its possible differentiations, it would be necessary that other levels exist, yet do not exist today, independent of the first and which the first should be subordinated, and not the other way around, as is the condition of things in contemporary society. This is why, when the hypertrophy of such evil and monstrous banking industrial trusts arrogates to itself the right to imperialism, we, unable to cry, can only laugh. And to calmly counter with the idea that a radical revolution against gold and capital is the inescapable premise of the true imperium. Passing through to the aspiration that spreads at the base of all revolutionary ideologies as symptom of revolt against modern slavery, we nevertheless transcend it, ascertaining that it is itself pervaded by the same evil, it likewise sees only economic and social problems, it does not demand liberation from the economic yoke in the name of differentiated, meta-economic, and metaphysical values, not because forces, free from economic concerns, can work in the depths, but rather only for an egalitarian and an even more socialistic arrangement considered better, of the same economic problem determined by the purely material and utilitarian needs of the masses. Whence, in such tendencies, arises a mistrust, an intolerance and an almost concealed resentment, let us not say for what is spiritual, but even for what is intellectual, deemed a luxury, beyond economic equilibrium, they do not have an eye for non-economic differences, neither seeing them nor desiring them, with the same spirit of plebeian and egalitarian intolerance of slaves and rebellion that was already revealed in the fall of ancient Romanity. In conclusion, it is necessary to fight the main root of the European evil with two weapons. We need not insist upon and stop at the first, it consists in creating an elite, in bringing out, conscientiously and tenaciously, new differences, interests, and new qualities form the undifferentiated substance of the individuals of today, so that an aristocracy, a race of masters, of rulers, may return. This, first and foremost. In the second place, what is necessary is a movement, a revolt from the depths, which frees us from the machine, from extrinsic, inorganic, automatic, violent dependence, which breaks the Jewish, capitalist, economic yoke, which mocks the duty of labor imposed as universal law and end in itself, which, in short, frees us, and opens a passageway for air and light, for hierarchy cannot be restored by violence, the control of needs, or the interplay of passions, interests and ambitions, but only by the free and spontaneous recognition which springs from the sense of values and of transcendent forces, from faithfulness toward one's own way of being, whatever it might be, from consciousness of nature, dignity and quality. An organic, direct, real, hierarchy, freer and stronger than any other. How not to recognize, then, that the reality of the past is also a prophetic myth for a better future? The return to the system of caste is the return to a system of truth, justice, and form in the higher sense. In the caste there is the ideal of a community of activity, profession, blood, heredity, laws, and rights, which correspond more precisely to pre-established, typical modes of being, to organic manifestations of nature suitably refined. In it, there is, as a presupposition, the will to be what one is, the will to realize one's own nature and destiny as quality, silencing the individualistic and opportunistic velities which are the cause of every disorder and disorganization. In it, there is the overcoming of quantitative uniformity, of centralization and of standardization. In it there is the basis for a social hierarchy which immediately reflects a hierarchy of modes of being, of values and of qualities, and which rises up from the material to the spiritual ordered by levels, from the formless to the deformed, from the collective to the universal and the supra-individual. In the most perfect way, ancient India shows us this ideal, which, however, is found in different forms in other civilizations as well, up to our Nordic Roman Middle Ages. Our point of reference cannot be anything else. 
as substratum, the healthy activity of the lowest class, Shudra, no longer anarchized by demagogic ideologies, led by experts in trading, commerce, and economic industrial organization, simplified through simplified needs, Vaishya, beyond the Vaishya, the Kshatriya, the warrior nobility who recognize the value and purpose of war, and in whose heroism, pride, and victory, the higher vindication of a whole people can burn, beyond the Kshatriya, the Brahmana, the solar race of spirit and wisdom, of those who see, Rishi who can, and who testify by their life that we are on top of this dark earth, but our vital roots are lost at the top in the brightness of the heavens. At the apex of everything, as myth and limit, the ideal of the Chakravartin, the king of the world, the invisible emperor, whose strength is hidden, powerful, and unconditioned. Science versus Wisdom As power, depersonalized and socialized, has become gold, capital, so likewise has wisdom, depersonalized and socialized, become concept, rationality. And this is the second root of the European evil. Philosophy as well as Western positive science are, in their essence, fundamentally socialistic, democratic, and anti-hierarchical. They propose as true only what can be universally recognized, which anyone can assent to, whatever life he allows himself to live, provided only that he has a certain education. And so, as in the criterion of the majority of political democratism, they presuppose equality, and, under the criterion of quantity, they dominate everything in this field that could be equality, the irreducibility of quality, or the prerogative of quality. And it is useless to promulgate individualistic, or even relativistic, doctrines, since in the manner of promulgating them, which is the conceptual manner of secular philosophy, it shows that one has adhered to the democratic, impersonal, and collectivist presuppositions which lie at the base of that very philosophy. The way is totally different, it would be necessary to begin by disputing, in the first place, those very presuppositions, if we do not want to fall again into the foolishness of an imperialism which, instead of imposing itself through that hierarchy from above, which was mentioned, appeals to popular recognition for its own justification. And here one will begin to realize the enemy we have to fight with, and how frighteningly the culture itself, not only the society of our contemporaries, in a democratism in action, and one begins to see what renunciation they must demand of themselves in order to regain health. Just as gold is a reality which has become indifferent to the quality of the individuals who own it, so is the knowledge of contemporary men. Let us put it better, following a will to equality, an anti-hierarchical intolerance, and, therefore, a socialistic prejudice, the knowledge of Europeans had necessarily to come to something on which the effective individual differences and of the condition, through knowledge, of an active individual differentiation, is reduced to a minimum. Thus, it referred either to physical experience, more or less equal for all men insofar as they are animals, positive science, or to the world of abstraction and of verbal conventions, philosophy and rationalism. The need for the socialization of knowledge has led fatally to its abstraction, and therefore created an insuperable hiatus between knowledge itself and life, between knowledge and being, as well as what can be the quality of phenomena and metaphysical reality. Thus, in the West, thought, when it is not reduced to a tool for the more or less conventional transcription of the most exterior, fully quantitative, and uniform aspect of material things, is the creator only of unreality, reified words and empty logical schematics, or becomes an intellectual sport, all the more ridiculous for the good faith in which it is practiced. From this comes the whole unreality of the modern spirit, split off from life, man today is almost a shadow that bustles among schemes and programs and intellectual superstructures powerless to dominate reality and life itself, while making himself more and more dependent upon a science which piles abstractions onto abstractions, slave as it is to phenomenal law ascertained but not understood by it, and exhausting himself in mechanical and exteriority, without any possibilities for the inner being of man. We certainly cannot get to the heart of this question here, due to the limits of the present exposition. It should not be thought, however, that it is unrelated to the problem of the empire, for us the problem of empire is the problem par excellence with respect to which more specialized problems cannot be separated and made into domains of their own. Particularism, the common indifference of the various forms of human activity, here politics, their science, here practice, their religion, and so on, is, as we have already stated, itself as an aspect of European decline, and an unequivocal symptom of Europe's inorganicity. The foundation of the imperial hierarchy must be based on knowledge, the why should govern, Plato already said, and this is a central, absolute, definitive point in every rational order of things. But nothing would be more ridiculous than to associate this knowledge with some technical competence, positive science, or philosophizing speculation, instead, it coincides with what, from the outset, we have called wisdom, 
a traditional expression used by both the classical West and the East. Wisdom is as much aristocratic, individual, real, substantial, organic, and qualitative, as the knowledge of the civilized is democratic, social, universalistic, abstract, leveling, and quantitative. Here again, there are two worlds, two eyes, two different visions, opposed against each other without any abatement. To know, according to wisdom, does not mean to think, but to be the thing known, to live it, to realize it inwardly. One does not really know a thing unless one can actively transform one's consciousness into it. Therefore, only what ensues from direct individual experience will count as knowledge. And, this is just the opposite of the modern mentality, for which, whatever appears immediately to the individual is called phenomenon, or subjective, and so it posits some other thing behind it as true reality, which is simply imagined or presumed, the thing in itself of the philosophers, the absolute of vulgar religion, matter, ether, or energy of science. Wisdom is an absolute positivism which regards only what can be grasped by direct experience as real, and everything else as unreal, abstract, and illusory. It will be objected that, from this point of view, all knowledge would be reduced to the finite and contingent things presented by the physical senses, and, indeed, this is the way things are, and how they must remain, for the great mass of men, who can only truly claim to know this finiteness and contingency, which remains such even after all the scientific pseudo-explanations. However, beyond this, we maintain the possibility of forms of experience different from the sensory forms of the common man, not given, not normal, which can be reached by means of certain active processes of inner transformation. The peculiarity of such transcendent experiences, of which the superworld, the field of beings, the seven heavens, the spheres of fire, and so on, were only different representations of humanity linked to tradition, is to be direct, concrete, and individual, as much as sensory experience itself and yet to see reality, beyond the contingent, spatiotemporal aspect characteristic of everything that is sensory. Aspects that science also tries to transcend, on condition of even transcending everything which is truly knowledge, vision, individual and living evidence, in favor of mere probabilities, incomprehensible uniformities, and abstract explanatory principles. This would be the sense in which we speak of metaphysical reality. It must be borne in mind, however, that we speak of experience, and only of experience, from the traditional point of view, there is not a finite reality and an absolute reality, but a finite manner and an absolute manner of experiencing reality, a finite manner and an absolute manner of experiencing reality, a finite eye and an absolute eye, the whole so-called problem of knowledge is enclosed within the interiority of every being, and does not depend on culture, but on his capacity for freeing himself from the human, i.e., from the sensory, the rational, and the emotional and of identifying himself with one or another form of metaphysical experience, along with a hierarchy which, at its limit, culminates in a state of perfect identity, spiritual vision, full supersensual and superrational accomplishment of the thing in the eye and of the eye in the thing, which realizes a state of power and, simultaneously, a state of absolute obviousness with respect to the thing itself, in which no longer asks oneself anything, and one discovers that it is just a successor to reason as it is to speak. This, in broad outline, is the meaning of the wisdom which constitutes the foundation of metaphysical teaching and of spiritual science, whose rite of initiation originally produced the transformation of consciousness necessary for knowledge and metaphysical vision, and whose tradition has maintained itself in the West, in clandestine form, even after the Semiticization and decline of its ancient civilization. The point to be borne in mind is that sacred and sapiential science, since, unlike secular science, is not a knowing, but a being, and cannot be taught by books or universities or transmitted by words, to gain it, it is necessary to be transformed, to transcend common life for a superior life. It measures exactly the quality and reality of individual life, of which it becomes an inviolable privilege and an organic part, rather than being a concept, or a notion, which can be put into one's head like something into a sack, without at the same time having to be transformed or to budge in the slightest in regard to what one is. Hence the natural aristocracy of wisdom, hence its resolute non-popularization, non-communicability. Another taboo of European cis precisely communicability, they think, more or less, that intelligible being and speakable being are the same thing. They do not realize that, although this may make sense with respect to intellectual abstractions and conventions at the basis of experiences, those characteristic of the physical senses, presumed to be roughly the same for everybody, nevertheless, where this uniformity ceases, where a qualitative differentiation is reasserted, discursive communicativity can no longer be a criterion. Since it is based precisely on the evidence of actual experiences beyond the experience of common men, 
wisdom leaves open just one road, to try and bring oneself to the same level, by means of a free and creative act, as the one who sets out the teaching, so a by knowing from experience what the other knows, or say with one word, what otherwise will remain only words. To the socialization, depersonalization, and conceptualization of knowledge, to the democratic inclination to popularize, to weaken the superior for the purposes of the inferior, so that the majority can participate in knowledge without a change of mind or ceasing to be inferior, we oppose, without compromise, the opposite aristocratic attitude. There must exist hierarchies in knowledge itself, there must exist many truths separated from each other by deep, immense, impassable gulfs, corresponding exactly to the many qualities of life and power, to the many distinct individualities, there must exist an aristocracy of knowledge, and universality, understood in a communicative, democratic, and uniform manner must cease to be a criterion. We must not descend to them, they are obliged to raise themselves to us, by dignifying themselves, by ascending for real, according to their possibilities, along the hierarchy of beings, if they want to partake of higher and metaphysical forms, which are the points of reference to themselves and to the lower and physical forms. From this, freedom also ensues, the open field, the breath that gives wisdom. In socialized knowledge there is always instead a hidden you must, a hidden, intolerant, moralistic constraint, scientific or philosophical truth demands to be recognized by everyone as the truth, in the face of it, one is not allowed to take a different stand. The expression of a collective despotism, it aims to reign despotically over all, making all equal with respect to it, and it is precisely on the basis of this will that it has organized, built its arms, its ordeals, its method, its violence. In wisdom, on the contrary, the individual is dissolved, restored, returned to himself, he has his truth, which expresses his life exactly and profoundly, which is a special way of experiencing and expressing reality, which does not contradict or exclude other, different ways, which are equally possible in the differentiation on which the hierarchy of wisdom is based. This discussion will suffice as far as the second root of the European evil and its corrective are concerned. Already, in this brief outline, the principle that the wise must govern is justified. In the order of wisdom, the hierarchy of knowledge is coextensive with the hierarchy of strength and superiority of individuals. Knowledge is being, and being ability and power, so that it attracts spontaneously to itself the dignity of imperium. The true foundation of the primordial concept, rooted in the tradition of divine royalty, was nothing other than this. Opposed to this, let us repeat, there is the whole of Europe, with its age-old inheritance and organization, there is, as we said, the reign of professors, intellectuals, glasses without eyes, the cultured, academic, university world, which, in claiming for itself the privilege of knowledge and spirit, testifies only to the extent which they have been able to push the decline and abstraction of modern man. Those who know and those who believe. But there is an even greater usurpation, that which religion, in the narrowest and newest sense of the term, accomplishes by securing for itself control and expertise in matters of the sacred and of the divine. The sacred and the divine are matters of faith. This is the truth which has been imposed on Europe of late. Our truth is otherwise, it is better to know to know that we don't know rather than to believe. In the contemporary mentality, there is a central point at which the attitudes of materialistic science and religion meet, in an identical renunciation, in an identical pessimism, in an identical agnosticism about the spiritual, declared and methodical in one case, veiled in the other. The premise of materialistic science is basically that science, in the sense of real, positive and empirical knowledge, can only subsist in what is physical, and that in the non-physical there can be no science, so that the scientific method neglects it and abandons it, by lack of authority, to belief, to the dull and arbitrary abstractions of philosophy, or to the exigencies of sentiment and morality. In addition, religion, insofar as it is focused exclusively on faith and does not admit an esoteric initiatory teaching beyond the profane religion imposed on the masses, or a gnosis beyond pious superstition, ends up with the same renunciation. In fact, one believes only when one does not know and thinks one cannot know. Hence, there is again the same agnosticism of the positivists with respect to whatever is not material and gross reality. We, on the contrary, basing ourselves on a tradition much more ancient and real than the one which can be claimed by the faith of Western man, on a tradition which is not proved by doctrines, but by deeds and acts of power and clairvoyance, affirm instead the possibility and the concrete reality of what we have called wisdom. We thus assert the possibility of a positive, direct, methodical, empirical knowledge in the metaphysical field, just as science strives to gain in the physical field, and, just like science, it remains above any moral or philosophical belief of men. 
Therefore, in the name of this wisdom and of those who can attest to this wisdom, we assert that all those who, within the scope of religious superstitions, by mere aspirations of the soul, by dogmas, traditions in the narrowest and most sectarian sense, hallucinations, and acts of blind faith, making themselves custodians of the sacred and of the divine, must be divested of authority and ousted. Those who know and who, insofar as they know and are able, just as those God-men known and venerated by all great ancient traditions, must replace those who believe, the blind leading the blind. And it appears, therefore, that dwelling on that which is anti-Europe and anti-democracy in the cognitive field, on what is wisdom, in the order of this very work, represents nothing but a superfluous deviation, regardless, the identification, which we can claim, of the two powers, the sacred and the temporal, in a unique intensely personalized hierarchy, could neither be justified nor understood, and instead the most sinister misunderstandings become possible. But, inclusive of what has been examined, our declaration that we intransigent imperialists do not know what to do with a religious hierarchy, as opposed to the Gnostic and initiatory one, is confirmed and justified. In truth, it would add nothing to a material organization to which perhaps it would be added, it would only add an empty outline of empty forms, the fantasies of faith and sentiment, the degradation into contradictory dogmas and into symbols and rites which are not its own and whose meaning it has lost. In sum, it would not produce the higher, solar, reality, testifying to it in potency, that we as pagans mean by spirit, but instead an absolute unreality, an anti-Aryan and anti-Roman rhetoric which is expressed in the same ethical field, favoring everything feminine, romantic, and escapist that is lurking in the Western soul. It is necessarily a surpassing of both religious unrealism and materialized realism by a transcendent, virile, Olympian positivism. Mechanical force and individual power. The third of the European illusions is mechanical power which comes from the technical applications of profane science, in which, in a unanimous voice, they instead believe they see the legitimate pride, the triumph of Western civilization. Regarding the democratism which abides in the idea of the universality of Western science, if the general spirit of the new Semitic doctrine is reflected in its socialist and egalitarian requirements, we should recognize also some antecedents in the Socratic method and in some aspects of later Greek intellectualism. Nevertheless, sharing in this kind of idea with Nietzsche, we may consider this an anticipation of and a prelude to the Judeo-Christian spirit, insofar as it is precisely in the Judeo-Christian spirit that we see the universalistic and egalitarian application manifest itself in the most overwhelming, concrete and unequivocal manner. Greek culture reflects more an aristocratic concept of knowledge and the principal motifs of its speculation were drawn from the wisdom traditions. The doctrine according to which actual knowledge is conditioned by a real process of purification and self-transformation, directed by an active individual initiative or by the traditional power of a right, and such knowledge is not a purely mental fact and even less, passing to another aspect, a matter of faith and of sentiment, remains a fundamental theme of the classical world, up until Neoplatonism. Instead, in the passive attitude of the followers of the new doctrine, in their intolerance towards every method and autonomous discipline of the individual as a path to a gnosis, to an actual spiritual experience, a concealed intolerance, still present in the various beliefs on revelation, grace, and the sinful aspect, which any direct and precise initiative relying on the soul forces of man assumes, in all this there are enough themes of renunciation which, joined with the democratic and egalitarian pathos, can sufficiently account for the efficiency of Christianity itself regarding the social, popularized, inorganic, impersonal, character of modern knowledge. But, beyond pernicious universalism, in modern science particularly, there is another fundamental point which comes from Christianity, we mean its dualistic presupposition. In modern science, nature, in fact, is thought as something different, as inanimate, external, completely separated from man, it is assumed, or it is thought to be assumed, to be a reality in itself, wholly independent of those who know it and, even more, of the spiritual world of those who know it. Now, what is revealed through and through is the theme characteristic of the unrealistic religious attitude in sharp contrast with the pagan Aryan image of the world. The theme of the opposition of spirit to reality, the dualistic theme, the subjectivity of spirit against the objectivity of nature, the theme of the loss of the sense of what spiritual objectivity means. Reaching this point, natural reality was made extraneous, mute, inanimate, external, material, and it is precisely as such that it constituted the object of new science, of Western profane science. Far from exhausting itself in naturalism, as today only the ignorance or the tendentious falsification of some people are able to present it, beyond knowing the ideals of manly overcoming and of absolute liberation, in the pagan conception, the world was a living body, suffused with secret, 
divine, and demonic forces, with meanings and with symbols, as illustrated by that saying of Olympiodorus, the sensible expression of the invisible. Man lived in an organic and essential connection with the forces of the world and of the superworld, so that it could be said, with the hermetic expression, to be a whole within the whole, composed of all the powers, the sense which is revealed by the Aryan aristocratic doctrine of the Atman is no different. And that conception was the basis on which, as a whole in its perfect way, the corpus of the sacred traditional sciences developed. Christianity smashed this synthesis, creating a tragic gulf. Thus, on the one hand, spirit became what is beyond, the unreal, the subjective, hence the primary root of European abstractionism. On the other hand, nature became matter, outward appearance closed in itself, enigmatic phenomenon, hence the attitude which was to give rise to modern science. And just as interior, direct, integral knowledge given by wisdom was replaced by external, intellectual, discursive scientific, profane knowledge, so the organic and essential connection of man with the deep forces of nature, which constituted the base of traditional right, of the power of sacrifice, and of magic, was replaced by an extrinsic, indirect, brute relation, the relation peculiar to technology and machine. Thus, in that way, the Semitic revolution contains the seeds of the mechanization of life. In the machine we find reflected the impersonal and egalitarian side of the science which produces it. In the same way that gold is dependency reduced to the impersonal, in the same way modern culture has as ideal a universalistic knowledge, good for all, inorganic and transmittable as one thing, we find ourselves on a level with the world of the machine facing an equally impersonal, inorganic power, based on automatisms which produce the same effects with an absolute indifference with respect to the one who acts. The whole immortality of such a power, which belongs to all and to no one, which is not value, which is not justice, which, by means of force, can make one powerful, without first making one superior, becomes clear. Just as, however, it is clear that it is possible only because not a shadow of true action is found in that order either, no effect, in the world of technology and the machine, is directly dependent upon the T-as its cause, but, between the one and the other, there is, as condition of efficacy, a system of determinisms and of laws which are known but not understood and which, by a pure act of faith, are deemed to be constant and uniform. For what the individual is and for direct individual power, scientific technology says nothing, or rather, in the midst of his knowledge of phenomena and of his innumerable diabolical machines, the individual today is extremely wretched and powerless, more and more conditioned rather than conditioning, moving more and more on a path on which the necessity of will is reduced to a minimum, the sense of oneself, the indomitable fire of the individual entity is gradually dying in weariness, in desolation, in degeneration. With the laws discovered by his science, which for us are mere statistical mathematical abstractions, he will also be able to succeed in destroying or in creating a world, but that does not mean that his real relation with the various events would be changed in any way, fire will continue to burn him, organic change to trouble his conscience, time, passion, and death to dominate him with their law. In general, he will be absolutely the same being as before, in the same situation as before relative to that level in the hierarchy of beings, which man with all that is human represents. To surpass that level, to integrate oneself, to accomplish the action, feeling it, leading it to work not below but above natural determinisms, not among phenomena, but among causes of phenomena, directly, with the irresistibility and the right proper to what is superior, this, instead, is the path to true power, which is identified with the path of wisdom itself, for where knowing entails being, certainly also entails power. But that task demands first of all the overcoming of dualism, the restoration of the pagan vision of nature, of that living conception, a sapiential imagery, which all great ancient civilizations had. When man, starting as a phantom, becomes once again a being who is and restores contact and conformity with the deep forces of nature, right, symbol and magic itself will no longer be fantasies, as the superstition of those who today would have it. Knowing nothing about it, they speak of it as a superstition surpassed by their science. And that power which is justice, which is the sanction of dignity, natural attribute of an integrated life into which he belongs as something living, individual, inalienable, will be known. We repeat what we said at the beginning, Europe has created a world which in all its parts constitutes an irremediable and complete antithesis to what the traditional world was. There are no possible compromises and reconciliations, the two conceptions are opposed to each other, separated by an abyss over which any bridge is illusory. Moreover, Semitic civilization is proceeding with a dizzying velocity toward its logical consequences, and its ultimate conclusion, without intending to be prophets, will not be a long time coming. 
those who foresee this conclusion and manage to feel all its absurdity and all its tragedy must therefore ask of themselves the courage to say no to everything. It is all one world. These considerations about science and machine show quite clearly how far renunciation must go and yet how necessary and unavoidable it is. This renunciation, however, is not a leap into the void. The same considerations show how a different system of values, possibilities, and knowledge, just as complete and total, is possible, a completely different man and world, which can be recalled out of the shadows and revived as soon as that wave of fever and madness starts to recede from the West. Activism in the Humanized World The so-called activist, evolutionistic, Faustian conception of life is closely connected with the coming of the machine in the West. The romantic exaltation of everything which is stress, quest, tragedy, religion, or, better said, drawing on Ganoun's expression, the superstition of life understood as an irrepressible tension, as a concern that never finds satisfaction in, in a perpetual thirst and in a perpetual disgust, moves without pause from form to form, from sensation to sensation, from invention to invention, the obsession with doing and with gaining, with what is new, with setting the record, with the unusual, all this constitutes the fourth aspect of the European evil, an aspect which characterizes unquestionably the physiognomy of Western civilization and which, these days, has really reached a feverish crisis. We already indicated how the root for his perversion also can be traced back to the Semitic lineage. The spirit of Messianism is its spirit, its original matter. The hallucination of another world and of a messianic solution which flees from the present is the need for escape of the failures, of the pariahs, of the accursed, of those who are powerless to assume and will the reality which is there, it is the inadequacy of the persons who suffer, whose being is desire, passion, and despair. Gradually, persistently hatched within the Semitic race and rendered still bolder and more necessary all the more of the political fortune of the chosen people stumbled, this obscure reality developed from the dregs of the empire and was the myth for the great revolt of the slaves, for the frenzied wave which pagan Rome was overwhelmed. And then, going beyond the Catholic order, pushing it aside, there was the spread of the millennial madness, and when the promise and the weight proved to be deceptive, and the goal receded to infinity, while need and desperation persisted and increased, what remained was a becoming without end, a pure tension, a gravitation to emptiness. The flight from this world and the never-ending withdrawing of the other, this anxiety towards the world which is the secret of modern life, and which shouts desperately that it is of value to escape the consciousness of oneself, is likewise the deeper secret of Christianity after the failure of its eschatology it is the imminent curse which it carries within itself and which spread to the peoples who converted to it, betraying the Olympian, classical, and Aryan ideal. Combining the first theme which we saw arising from the messianic figure, the theme of the ecclesia which has become the law of social interdependence, with that second theme which has the same origin, combining those two themes we find ourselves facing the very law which dominates the whole culture and society of today, on the lower plane, the industrialist fever, means which become ends, mechanization, the system of economic and materialist determinisms for which science beats the rhythm, linked with social climbing, with the race for success of men who do not live, but are lived, and, ultimately, the newest, already mentioned, myths of infinite progress on the basis of social service and of work having become an end in itself and universal duty, on the higher plane, the whole of the Faustian, evolutionistic, Bergsonian doctrines which we mentioned above, and the basis of socialized truth, of the becoming of knowledge, of universalism, and of the impersonalism of the philosophies. In the last analysis, all this confirms and testifies to one thing, the same thing, the decadence in the West of value and of individuality, of that value which it chatters about with so much impudence. Only lives which are not self-sufficient and which lose interest in themselves seek, in fact, for the other, they need society, a system of mutual supports, a collective law, and they aim, since they are not being, they are quest, dissatisfaction, dependence upon the future, they are becoming. They are terrified by man's natural environment, by silence, by solitude, by idle time, by the eternal, and they act, they toss restlessly, they turn here and there unceasingly, dealing with everything except themselves. They act to feel themselves, to prove that they exist, demanding form action and all that they do its own confirmation, actually, they do not act, but are obsessed by action. This is the meaning of the activism of the moderns. It is not action, but the fever of action. It is the mad race of those who have been pushed away from the axis of the wheel and whose race is all the more insane the greater their distance from the center. That race, that velocity, just as the tyranny of social law in the economic, industrial, cultural, and scientific domain, is entirely lethal, in the whole order of things which they have created, once the individual wandered from himself, once, 
with the sense of centrality, of stability, and of inner sufficiency, he also lost the sense of what really constitutes the value of individuality. The twilight of the West follows unquestionably from the twilight of the individual as such. We said at the beginning that people today no longer know what action is. This is the truth. Those who would skim through some traditional Indian doctrines, with which, in addition, correspondences could be found also in our classical West, would certainly be surprised at the affirmation that everything which is movement, activity, becoming, and change is characteristic of the passive and feminine principle, Shakti, whereas immobility is to be referred to the positive, masculine, solar principle, Shiva. And in the same way, they would not quite realize the meaning of the other affirmation, contained in a relatively more well-known text, the Bhagavad Gita. Chapter 4, according to which the wise man distinguishes non-action from action and action from non-action. What is expressed in this is neither quietism nor contemplative nirvana in any way, what is expressed, on the contrary, is the consciousness of what activity really is. The concept is rigorously identical to the one which Aristotle expressed in speaking of unmoved movers. The one who is the cause of and in control of movement is not moved himself. He arouses, controls, and directs movement, he causes the act, but does not act, that is to say, he is not led by, not involved in action, he is not action, but rather an impassable, very calm superiority, whom action comes from and depends upon. This is why his potent and invisible control can be called, with Lao Tzu, an action without action, Wei Wu Wei. His opposite, the one who acts is acted on, the one who is seized by action, the one who is drunk with action, with will, with force in elan, in passion, in enthusiasm, is already an instrument, he does not act but is subject to action, thus he appears, to these doctrines, as a feminine principle and a negation with respect to the higher, transcendent, motionless, and Olympian mode of the masters of motion. Well, what is exalted today in the West is precisely this negative, decentered, lower, action, a drunken spontaneity which is unable to control itself and to create a center for itself, whose law is outside itself and whose secret workings is a will to dissipate and to keep up a whirl of activity. Thus, they call positive and masculine, and exalt, what is completely negative and feminine. In their blindness, contemporary men of the West do not see anything else and imagine that interaction, the secret force which does not create machines, banks, and companies, but men and gods, is not action, but renunciation, abstraction, a waste of time. Power, thus, is reduced to a synonym for violence. Will is identified more and more only with the single type of what is animal-like and muscular, of that which the one assumes an antithesis, a resistance, within or outside himself, against which he strains and wears himself out. Tension, struggle, effort, aspiration, nisus, struggle, these are the watchwords of this activism. But all this is not action. Action is something elementary. It is something, simple, terrible, irresistible. There is no room in it for passion or for its antithesis, nor for effort, and even less for humanity and feeling. It starts from absolute centers without hatred, without craving, and without pity, from a calmness which terrifies and immobilizes, from a level of creative indifference superior to every opposition. It is command. It is the fearsome power of the Caesars. It is the concealed and silent action of the emperors of the Far East, inevitable like the forces of nature, whose purity it shares. It is what can still be felt breaking out of the magic immobility of some Egyptian portraits, of the fascinating slowness of certain ritual gestures. It is the naked, new Machiavellianism, in all its hardness and its inhumanity. It is what bursts out when, as in the high feudal Middle Ages, man becomes alone again, man next to man or man against man, cloaked in his strength or in his weakness, without escape, without law. It is what shines when, in heroism, in sacrifice, or in great sacrilege, a force stronger than good and evil, mercy, fear and happiness arises in man, a force before which the eye no longer stares either at itself or at others and in which arises the primordial power of circumstances and persons. What is called in physics dissipation of energy by friction, this is what, instead, Europeans call heroism, in which, like children, they pride themselves. The torment of torn up souls, the pathos of naive weaklings powerless to control themselves, to impose upon themselves silence and absolute will, all this is exalted in the West in the name of the tragic sense of life since unbalance and dualism, guilty conscience, the sense of sin, of man as enemy of himself and angry against himself, has grown in the soul. And complication arose from complication, action disappeared behind pleasure of feeling and of torment. Resistance, that is powerlessness, became a condition for the sense of self, hence the need for effort, the romantic exaltation of violence, the running in circles, the yearning, 
the superstition that the value is not in arriving, but in the running, not mastery and control, but painful, struggling, conquest, not precise, bare, fulfilled, realization, but unending task. Christianity, denying classical harmony, the sense of autarky and of absolute limit, the sense of Olympian superiority, of Dorian simplicity, of active, positive, hard, imminent force has prepared the ground for a world of the obsessed and the shackled. Everyone in the West knows of chains, blood, and darkness, but nothing of freedom. The shout of freedom, which is heard ringing out everywhere, is only a shout of prisoners, a howling of chained wild animals, a voice which comes from below. Modern voluntarism is not will, but a desperate rhetoric which is substituted for will, a mental effusion to convince oneself of a will which one does not have. Identical obsessive signs, symptoms of worry, assertions which only testify to the lack of and the need for what they assert, are all modern exhalations of power and of individuality, the desperate aspects of European decadence under a hard law of seriousness and duty. For everything in the West is, in a sinister way, serious, tragic, unfree. Everything betrays a sense of deep coercion which, in some, manifests as rigorism, prohibitionism, imperativism, moralist or rationalist intolerance, in others as romantic impulse and human pathos. Crystalline clarity, agile simplicity, detached in a spiritual joy of free play, irony, and aristocratic superiority, all this exists and is conceived of only as a myth. In anything there reigns instead a new sense of identification, of collapse, of greedy interest. It is the world of Michelangelesque prisons which still echoes in humanity, embellished with heroism and universality, with a Beethoven and a Wagner. And, how much seriousness and romantic passion there is in the Nietzschean exaltation of the gay science, in the very laugh of Zarathustra. The curse of the crucified God has spread everywhere, has wrapped the whole of Europe, a block of metal and blood, in its deep pain. This human sense of life, so typical of the modern West, confirms its plebeian and lower aspect. That which some were ashamed of, man, others took pride in. The ancient world elevated the individual to God, made every effort to unbind him from passion, to adapt him to transcendence, with the free air of the heights in contemplation as well as in action, in new traditions of non-human heroes and of men of divine blood. The Semiticized world not only deprived the creature of the divine, but finally reduced God to a human figure. Bringing back to life the demonism of a Pelasgian substratum, it substituted the pure Olympian regions, vertiginous in their radiant perfection with the terrorist viewpoints of his apocalypses, of hells, of predestination, of perdition. God was no longer the aristocratic god of the Romans, the god of the patricians, to whom one prays standing, in the light of the fire, head up high and which is carried at the head of the victorious legions, it was no longer Donar Thor, the exterminator of Thrym and Hymir, the strongest of the strong, the irresistible, the master of the refuge against terror, whose fearsome weapon, the hammer Mjolnir, in a representation corresponding to the Vajra of Shiva, the same lightning force which hallowed the divine kings of the Aryans, it was no longer Odin Votan, the one who brings victory, the eagle, the host of the heroes who, in death on the battlefield, celebrated the highest cult of sacrifice and were transformed into the phalanx of immortals, but become, to say it with Roger, the patron of the wretched and of the desperate, the holocaust, the comforter of the afflicted who is implored with tears of ecstasy in the annihilation of oneself. Therefore, the spirit was materialized, the soul softened. Only what is passion, feeling, effort, was then experienced. Not only the supramundane sense for Olympian spirituality, but also for virile Nordic Roman dignity disappeared little by little and, in a general degeneration, a contorted world of tragedy, of suffering and of seriousness followed, the human world instead of the epic and Dorian world. Humanism, in all this, a dirty fog exhaled from the earth, which has prevented the vision of the heavens, some take pride as being the value of the West. It spreads effectively in each of its forms, it is at the root of old and new romanticisms, of all sentimentalisms, of all modern enthusiasms of action and will. And we shout, it is necessary to purify oneself from it. The task is just as hard as the eradication of the other described elements which canonize European decadence. What is human must be overcome, absolutely, without mercy. But, to come to this, it is necessary that individuals attain the feeling of inner liberation. Let it be known that this cannot be the object of thirst, it cannot be the object of a greedy quest by the shackled who, as such, have no right to it. Either it is, as a simple matter which is neither solemnly proclaimed nor theorized about, which is barely noticed, as a natural, elementary, and inalienable presence of the elect, or it is not. The more it is sought and desired, the more it is elusive, because necessity is fatal to it. It is necessary to regain consciousness, as the one who, 
realizing that he is running, gasping for breath in the scorching heat, would say to himself, so? What if I walked more slowly? And, walking more slowly, so? What if I stopped walking? And, ceasing to walk, so? What if I lie down on the ground, here, in the shade? And, lying on the ground, he would feel an infinite rest and recall with amazement his race, his old haste, likewise, the soul of the moderns, which does not know rest, silence, nor a breathing space, must be gradually appeased. It is necessary to bring men back to themselves and to force them to find in themselves their purpose and their value. They should learn again to feel alone, without help and without law, until they awaken to the act of absolute command and of absolute obedience. So that, looking coldly around, they realize that there is nowhere to go, that there is nothing to ask for, nothing to hope for, nothing to fear. They should breathe again, released from the weight and acknowledge the misery and the weakness of both love and hate. They should stand up as simple, pure, and yet no longer human things. In the superiority of aristocrats, in the highest state of souls and control themselves, they mock the turbid avidity with which slaves rush at the banquet of life. They retreat into an active indifference capable of everything in accordance with a renewed innocence. The power of putting their own life on the line and to stare, smiling, into the abysses, of giving without passion, of acting while placing on the same level both victory and defeat, success and failure, it should spring from that superiority which disposes of oneself like a thing and in which the experience of a principle than every death and every corruption truly awakens. The sense of rigidity, of effort, of the brute you must. No longer exists except as the memory of an absurd mania. Acknowledging the illusion of all evolutions, of all providential plans, of all historicisms, acknowledging the illusion of all the goals and the reasons as leashes necessary only for those who, still children, don't know how to walk on their own, men will cease to be moved but will move. If their tea becomes their center, men and no longer ghosts, action in its primitive, elementary, absolute sense will spring up again from them. And, here, then, if the poisonous fog of the human world is dispelled, besides intellectualism, besides psychology, besides the passion and the superstition of men, nature in its free and essential state will reappear. Everything around will become free again, everything will breathe, at last. The great disease of romantic man, faith, will now be overcome through experience. To man, thus reintegrated, new eyes, new ears, new wings, will really and spontaneously open. The supernatural will cease to be the pallid escape of pallid souls. It will be reality and will become on in the same thing with the natural. In the pure, calm, powerful, and incorporeal light of a revived Dorian simplicity, spirit and form, interiority and exteriority, reality and super-reality, will become in the same thing in the balance of both members, of which none is higher, none is slower than the other. It will thus be an epoch of transcendent realism, in the forces of those who believe they are men and do not know they are sleeping gods, the forces of the elements will awaken, up to the thrills of absolute illumination and of absolute resurrection. And then the other great human constraint, that of the faceless social amalgam, will also be overcome. If the law which has made them parts of machines, stones linked together in the impersonal cement of collective despotism and humanitarian ideologies is swept aside, Individuals will each be the beginning and end in themselves, each closed in himself like worlds, rocks, peaks, clad only in their strength and in their weakness. To everyone a place, a combat post, a quality, a life, a dignity, a distinct force, matchless, irreducible. Their moral will be, you must assert yourself over the need to communicate and to understand each other, over the ignominy of the pathos of fraternity, over the sensual delight of loving and feeling loved, of feeling equal and close, assert yourself over that subtle force of corruption which dissolves and weakens the sense of aristocracy. Incommunicability will be desired, in the name of an absolute and virile respect, valleys and peaks, stronger forces and weaker forces, one beside the other or one against the other, loyally acknowledged, in the discipline of the spirit inwardly on fire but externally stiff and hard as steel, containing the immensity of the infinite to a magnificent extent, militarily, as in a warlike enterprise, a sun the battlefield. Precise relationships, order, cosmos, hierarchy. Rigorously specific groups which organize, without intermediaries and without attenuations, through actions in which some will luminously rise, others will irremediably fall. Above, solar and haughty beings, a race of masters with a long, distant, fearsome look, which does not take, but gives slight and power superabundantly, and, in a resolute conduct of life, aspires to a more and more extraordinary intensity, yet always balanced in its supernatural calm. Then the romanticist myth, that of man and of the human, will vanish and we will approach the threshold of great liberation. 
In a world of limpidity, the words of Nietzsche, the precursor, will then be able to ring out in a transcendent sense, how beautiful, how pure, these free forces, no longer stained by spirit.